we get that out. And what I want you to do when you look at this one is to note that there's actually a correspondence between the pitch of the sound and the posture of the bird. Can you hear the low frequency sound and the high frequency sound? When it's doing the low frequency sound, it's got its beak closed and its head pushed out. And then when it goes to the high frequency note, pulls its head back and opens up its beak. And these movements can be quite accelerated and quite dramatic for bird songs. So what we began to think in this research that I began over 10 years ago in Galapagos was essentially designed to look at birds and bird diversity in a somewhat different way. This is a diagram of Galapagos finches from published by Charles Darwin back in 1836. And this is a, a very famous diagram. It was around the Darwin finches where Darwin began to develop his ideas about natural selection and evolution. These are different species of Darwin finches that when we look at them, we think about them as examples of adaptation. The beaks have adapted by natural selection to the food environments. And we know, for example, that this bird is adapted to feed on a large, heavy seed. This is a bird at the opposite end that's adapted by evolution to feed on small insects. And we have all sorts of gradations in between. Most people look at that and they say, evidence for natural selection. What we now begin to think about when we look at, we think about the role of the beak in singing, is that maybe these adaptations have had secondary consequences on the way that they can sing. Because in a sense, in, in essence, the adaptations have changed, led to a diversification of the musical instruments that these birds carry around. And in particular, we would predict that this kind of bird with a very big beak should be limited in its singing capacity. Because it's got all this force application uh, in its face, it's really able to apply very strong forces. We would predict that there's a, 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 a likely or a consequential trade-off in velocity. If you have a system that's designed to apply a lot of force, then you can't open that system very closely. You can't move it very quickly. It doesn't have a very rapid capacity to change. And so we would predict that birds like these would get stuck. They would be able only to sing very poor tunes. They would be poor musicians. They would, it would essentially be like trying to play a very fancy piece on a tuba, which is much harder to do than if you are endowed with an instrument that's more like a piccolo. We would expect the musical scores that these birds enjoy to be somewhat divergent as a result of their adaptation. I think maybe I've said that a couple of times too many. All right, so what do we do in our field work? Well, I went for one year, and I never thought I'd go back, but it's worked out. I've got funding from the National Science Foundation, and we go to the Galapagos Islands. And we spent a lot of time, oh yeah, so uh, what began as a postdoc project at the University of Arizona has grown into a large group of people uh, based at UMass, who, um, who actually began at UMass, who were all together going to visit the Galapagos Islands and doing research. Um, and this here was my former graduate student, Sarah. We have people here from Canada, from Belgium, from Ecuador, and from Panama, so a nice international team. And what do we do? Well, we go around and we catch birds in nets, and um, we, we, when we have the birds, we take a lot of measurements on them. First thing we do is we put bands on them so we know who is who when we release them. So this bird has a metal band with three color bands. And then when we release them, we can do various things such as record their songs. And when we look at their songs and we compare them to the morphology, we see a nice relationship in a way that supports this musical acoustics constraint hypothesis. So let's take a look first at these um, upper three birds, these are the large, medium, and small ground finch. Very similar birds, except they differ in size and in the size of the beaks. We would predict that this guy has the more bulky, more cumbersome musical instrument as a result of selection for feeding on heavy, strong items. And then when we listen to the songs, you can see divergence in the structure of the songs that supports that idea. So if we can go over the first one, listen to that first song. Not an, a very impressive song. The medium ground finch steps up in pitch, uh, steps up in, in tempo. And then the small ground finch, we got a little a lag here. Well, you can almost see what it's, what it, what it's gonna sound like. There, it kicks along at a much more rapid pace. And we think that that's made possible by the greater dexterity inherent, inherent in the beat. Okay. So this has been one theme of our work in Darwin's Finches. And what I'd like to do now is to, uh, for the remaining minutes that I have, 
is to consider how this relationship between beaks and song might influence the process of evolution as Darwin was thinking about it. So this is Darwin when he was young, and he, he, was, he kept very meticulous notes about his thoughts and about his encounters with people and his meetings and his ideas. And this is a diagram from one of his notebooks. It's a very well-known diagram. It's a diagram that emerged from a conversation that he had with an ornithologist at the British Museum of Natural History who was looking at his Darwin's finch specimens. They, were, of course, were not called Darwin's finches at the time. And basically, the curator at the museum told Darwin that those four different forms, those four different birds labeled A, B, C, and D that I showed you in Darwin's, uh, in the prior figure, that they were related to each other because, or they appeared to be related because they all had traits in common and they, none of them had been known before to scientists. And so Darwin was sitting there and he thought, well, maybe they all come from a common ancestor. So he drew what's essentially the first evolutionary tree, that they came from some ancestor and through some process of descent with modification, they diverged into these different ends. And inherent in this process is, is the idea that these birds are interacting with each other and potentially um, the way that they evolve will, inter will, will affect the way that their future evolution occurs. And so let me tell you a little bit about how beaks and song and the correlation between the two might affect this process because they do have a very specific way that they could actually facilitate the branching of a single ancestor into multiple descendants. And so what I want to do is, well, first show you. <laughs> there are a lot of people are interested in this particular figure, uh, the, the Darwin figure, that is. And I want to show you how songs are used in the natural history, the natural interactions of Darwin's finches. This will set up uh, the, the way that we think about how the beak song correlations might influence finch evolution. So this is an example of and this is a photo of the field site where we primarily work. And most of the time, if you can see it looks kind of drab and brownish, most of the time it's, it's dry. The plants don't have any leaves, and there's just not much action. Um, at, in, at the equatorial line, there's a lot of variation in seasonality. And so many years we go there, and it's very dry, and the birds are kind of just sitting around playing a waiting game. Because they can't do much in terms of breeding, they can't raise babies until they get some rain. Because when the rains come, there are insect larvae that are waiting for that rain. They then emerge, and the birds have a ready supply of food for their babies. So when the rains come, and it's a marvelous thing when it happens, you see a very rapid change in the local environment where the finches are, are living. And very quickly, they start setting up for breeding. What happens is that the males, who have this dark plumage, they start building nests. They build a bunch of display nests. And it looks like that. And they start to sing. They sing essentially to advertise their territory, to tell other males, hey, I'm here. If you come here, I'm going to deal with you like, uh, like the Hitchcock birds. And it tells females that, hey, I'm here. I've got a nice territory. Maybe you want to come hang out with me. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's an inviting uh, little song that they sing. When a female decides that she likes a certain male, you can actually see the females flying around and checking out different males, she will indicate that by starting to contribute to the building of a nest. And in fact, we now know that the female doesn't actually just contribute. She, re she rips the nest apart and starts from scratch. <laughs> <laughs> Apparently, that always rings. Um, it kind of hurts for, for, you know, for, for the males in the audience. <laughs> and you can actually witness their mating, their populations. There's a female that's sitting in her nest on eggs. Um, there are some eggs, it's hard to see that. And eventually, chicks hatch out, and, um, and everybody's happy. <laughs> now, what's the significance of the beak-song correlation that I was just telling you about? Well, songs are communication signals, and beaks have to do with feeding. What's the link? Well, there is a particular way that we think about the origin of new species that suggests a link. So this is a, a, an image of, that I, uh, I took from the airplane window <coughs> flying out of the Galapagos. This is Baltra Island, and this is Santa Cruz Island. The Galapagos Islands is an archipelago. There are many opportunities for different populations of these birds to become isolated. And when we think about really the most simple models of what we call speciation, the generation of new species, we imagine a scenario by which there is one species that turns into two descendant species. And that can work. That can be spurred on by the separation of different populations. And in case of little birds that don't fly very far, different islands can provide the separation. So imagine you have one founding species that then sets up populations on both species, uh, on both islands. There are some adventurous birds from here, let's say, that go over to there. 
They will encounter different food environments. They will evolve different sized bees. And then the question becomes, at which point are they separate species? Well, if these species, or these uh, incipient species, is what could be new species, come back into contact, the question is whether or not they're going to mate with one another. If their songs have evolved to be different, then we would say that it's easier for females to tell the difference between who's who and make it easier for them to make the correct assessment and to avoid mating with males from the other pop, from the other island. It's good to mate to type. And so with this scenario, we think that the evolution of the beaks actually drives the changes in the song and makes it more likely for these birds to tell who, who, who's who apart and to make the correct decisions. So how do we test this? This is a, a conceptual model. And I'm just going to show you three very quick slides that summarize, to some extent, the kind of research that we've been doing. And I actually give research seminars on, on this where I spend 40 minutes. But I'll just, uh, in, in really three minutes, I will go over the slides. There's one field site we've been studying. And this has been the source of a lot of our recent papers that we're really excited about. There is this one field site where there are actually two flavors or two morphs of the same species. These are the medium ground finches. And we actually have a large medium ground finch and a small medium ground finch. <laughs> and it's not like this at most populations, but at this particular site, it's like that. Now, within this particular population, we find that the songs sound different by morph. So not just between the species. It's not like the contrast between a tuba and a piccolo, but between different types of, let's say, violins. These small morphs sing songs that are more complex, that require greater dexterity with the beak. And the large morphs sing song, uh, birds sing songs that are simpler. And with this, we also note that females, and shown here, this is a pair that flew into a net together. These are, this is a pair that was tending the nest. Don't worry, we release them and let them continue uh, taking care of their babies. The females choose males that are typically about the same size as their own. So large morphed females, they choose large morphed males. This kind of makes sense because when they have offspring, the offspring are going to inherit the beak size. If they have a, a offspring together, we would predict large beaks, which would be well suited to the large seeds that are there. If the female chose incorrectly, if she chose poorly, she would have a baby that's intermediate in beak size and would not be well adapted to the environment. And so with this kind of finding, we are finding support for this model that as um, females are choosing males, it's based on the songs. It may be based also on the, the, the way the male looks. These things are all tied together. Females can make a very accurate assessment of the males because of this relationship between beaks and song. They choose very well and precisely. And that is potentially why, in Darwin's finches, we've moved from one species about 3 million years ago to 15 descendant species, very rapid speciation. And it's been a question as to why. And we think that this mechanism contributes to that contributes to that speciation. So to summarize, just a couple more slides. Darwin's finch evolution is powered by a couple of things. It's powered by the fact that there's this beak song correlation. It's powered by the fact that you can have populations that are separated on different islands. But potentially most interestingly, it's powered by female preferences. And powered by the fact that females are very choosy about who they're going to mate with. And if they continue mating to type, and they mate to, their, mate to the correct island, then that's going to encourage the diversification. So that's my story, and I'm sticking to it. <laughs> and I, I actually went over by a minute, I apologize. So without further ado, 